and then he has pictures of these artifacts in the brick. Uh, obviously, Yulsra didn't do this, and then concludes, and this is a very flat-footed statement for a criminologist, a careful scientist to make. He says, it is absolutely, positively out of the question to think that these artifacts, which he saw, could have been planted. Now, that's Perry Mason, <laughs> or Earl Stanley Gardner's conclusion. He proved it. In, in, in his mind, there was no question but that these certainly go back much further than Earl Stanley Gardner. Well, we didn't really know what dinosaurs looked like before the 1900s, or didn't know that well. We had a, a very poor view, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but further testing was done by these two men, Hapgood and Gardner. Uh, radiocarbon dates uh, were obtained, submitted by Professor Hapgood to Isotopes Incorporated in New Jersey. And uh, sample number one was about 3,500 years, and then 6,400 years, and then uh, 3,000 years. And so there was a significant range. But if these are over 200 years, they are before we knew anything about dinosaurs, and they're supposed to have been gone then for 65 million years. Well, 6,000, 3,000, 2,000, probably just over 3,000 years ago, uh, we have figurines. They were also submitted by Professor Hapgood to the University of Pennsylvania Museum Testing Facility for thermoluminescent dating, which is probably the most appropriate dating system for pottery. Uh, we won't go into great detail about how that works. Uh, but it's, it's a different type system and particularly suited for pottery. Sample number one came back about 2500 B.C. Uh, and then number two and number three and number four all right on the same date, 2500, very consistently. Uh, and this would logically be the most reasonable conclusion for the date. Obviously, these labs are going to come under scrutiny for putting out such material. And that was the case here. Nevertheless, uh, Dr. Rainey, who's director of the Pennsylvania Museum, issued a statement regarding this, uh, defending his conclusion. He said, we've had years of experimentation both here and at the lab at Oxford. We have no doubt at all about the dependability of the thermoluminescent method. I should also point out, he continues, that we were so concerned about the extraordinarily ancient date of these figurines that Mark Hahn and our lab made an average of 18 runs on each one of the four samples. Four samples, 18 runs on each one, because this, this is extraordinary information. And uh, <laughs> they still continued to get the same consistent dates. Uh, he continues then saying, all in all, the lab stands on these dates for the Jules Rudd, mater Jules Rudd material, whatever this means in terms of archaeological dating in Mexico or in terms of the fake versus authentic pieces. The lab takes the stand because they were extraordinarily cautious and made 18 runs on four samples. Well, they took even greater flack when this letter came out, and three months later he withdrew it without giving any reason at all. Uh, I think I know exactly why he withdrew it, but he certainly was not because of empirical evidence. It was because of the philosophical pressure of his peers. With such information, I was intrigued. What, uh, what is the, the truth? What is the, the, the answer to this mystery in a Combro? I went down with uh, Dr. Dennis Swift to personally investigate this material. Uh, we were there in uh, 1999 twice, uh, and then in 2000, and actually we've, <laughs> we've made about a dozen trips now. When we first got there, this is the scene that depicts where they were, and uh, actually they were locked in, in this door that you see in the background, behind that door with a padlock in the back of the police department. Uh, they were hoping nobody would find out about it. They were hidden and had been there for about 30 years. Um, why? Well, this is an embarrassment. You're not supposed to find evidence of humans and dinosaurs, and they wanted to appear uh, intelligent. And it took a great deal of effort to get that door open. But we finally did, and uh, with uh, 
pressure, actually, from outside sources, uh, political pressure, we were able to examine two of the 60 crates of materials that were stored behind that door the first time that we came down. And sure enough, even in just the two crates, which is a random sampling of over 60, uh, we found strange ceramic figurines, including figurines of dinosaurs. The second time we came down, we were able to e examine more crates, still not all of them. But here we have a number of them spread out on the table. Dr. Swift is actually mocking the, the great security with which these were guarded. They had a soldier there with an AK-47 guarding us. And as we looked at these figurines, he grabbed it from him and posed with the figurines. But uh, they had been, of course, under lock and key. Nobody could see them. But uh, with our investigation, we finally brought them to light and were able to make uh, a photographic uh, record of a number of these. We see in this picture uh, an, an amazing variety, uh, both of ethnicity and styles and materials that are reflected in these figurines. Of the 33,000, about 2,600 of them are of dinosaurs. And I think you can see that very obviously here. Uh, one amazing thing uh, about the sauropod types is that many of them were shown standing upright. We didn't know about this until Robert Bacher told us this in Dinosaur Heresies, in his book 1986. But it looks like he had one of the Acombero figurines shown here on the right as a model for what he illustrated in his book, Dinosaur Heresies. Of course, then Spielberg convinced us all that they, they stood upright. But 3,000 years ago, uh, obviously, they knew that down in Acombero. Now, this is what uh, we thought dinosaurs looked like way back in about 1850. This is supposed to be a picture of an iguanodon, one of the earliest dinosaurs that were excavated. Well, that's not very close, but that's what we thought in 1850. By the turn of the century, this was 1895, we had him depicted differently, kind of a stand-up alligator with a long tail dragging the floor. Not very accurate, but closer. But now then we know that Iguanodon looked like this. This is a restoration from uh, the year 2000. So now we've got a pretty good idea. Notice the almost horse-like head and the, the tail that sticks out right. The ossified tendons along the tail show that it was uh, stood out right like a bird. Uh, if it drooped to the ground, that meant it was broken. But notice how the people in a Combero uh, depicted this over 3,000 years ago just almost identical to what we now have finally learned. This is the way they looked <laughs> when we first started in the 1800s, 1900s, but now then we know it looks like this, and the folks in Acombero got it right 3,000 years ago, as they did with the, the stand-up sauropods. Another figurine appears uh, to look just like the ankylosaur that we see depicted here. <laughs> very, very similar. Uh, there's a wide range. I suppose sauropods are the most popular, but 2,600 of these that I've examined, I have 20,000 digital image, images that I personally took of this collection. We've examined it carefully. Here are flying pterosaurs. And uh, a totally different style, different materials, uh, obviously a different artist. Um, some of the critics have said, well, it's all made by the same fella uh, in a short period of time, uh, to, to, and the, the numbers were to impress people. 33,000 is, is kind of overkill, isn't it? And certainly there's a tremendous variety of styles and materials not made out of the same stuff as is obvious to an objective observer, uh, but a bewildering array of mysterious creatures. What in the world were these for? Uh, I think the most reasonable explanation is that they were apropopatic. This is a, a fancy word that archaeologists use, uh, actually coined from the investigations over in Mesopotamia where they found caches of these buried under the threshold of dwellings or where dwellings had been. 
and we find these often in caches of 20 uh, up to 30 in uh, packed in sand surrounded of course by the clay soil and it would appear that they were buried carefully some have suggested maybe the enemies were coming and they buried their gods their idols uh, to protect them from the invasion I strongly suspect they were like the apropatic uh, figurines in Mesopotamia that were buried under the threshold to ward off evil spirits and that's what this fancy word means it's to, to scare off the evil spirits well if you're going to scare off spirits I suppose